Okay, I think I'll allow for one more minute as I see people joining. We still have people coming in. So I guess we can uh, start the recording. Okay. Mm. Okay. All right, so I think this is the last day of our school. Um, I'll, uh, let's uh, look forward to hear from the uh, final uh, lecture by Kazuya Yonakura. Uh, yes, go ahead. Ah, okay, uh, thank you very much. Okay, so yesterday uh, I talked about the construction of chiral fermions as a boundary mode. So I, so I, I consider that this kind of situation. So we have a d dimensional manifold W and d plus one dimensional manifold Y. And on Y, uh, we put a massive fermion. Then, if we take the mass parameter to be negative in this bulk, then we can obtain some chiral fermion on the boundary. And in that way, uh, uh, we can realize chiral fermions. And then, uh, so this was an important point. So in the modern formulation of anomalies, everything is uh, formulated in a ga completely gauge invariant way. And maybe yesterday I didn't write this explicit formula, but, uh, but uh, in this uh, situation, uh, we can define the partition function by using Pauli Villas regulator uh, like this. So this small m is the physical mass, and this capital M is the Pauli Villas mass. And then we can just take the ratio between uh, these two, and then we get a completely gauge invariant definition of the partition function. So everything is completely gauge invariant, but the definition of the d-dimensional uh, chiral fermion theory may depend on the d plus one dimensional uh, bulk. And that is uh, modern interpretation of the anomaly. And today, uh, I want to discuss uh, this dependence uh, on the d plus one dimensional bulk. And I compute this dependence more explicitly. And the result turns out to be given by the Atiyakatsu Shinga Yeta invariant. So, uh, so I consider this quantity. This is a, the partition function on Y uh, with the boundary condition L. And the, uh, uh, so maybe I write it again. So I don't use this explicit form today, but this boundary condition is uh, given by this condition. So tau equal zero is the boundary. And then uh, I impose uh, the condition that this psi is an eigenvector with eigenvalue plus one under this gamma tau. Okay, now uh, to compute uh, this quantity, uh, it's convenient to change our point of view. So, so far, uh, we have looked at the system uh, in this way. So this uh, direction tau is a space direction. And this boundary uh, is a spatial boundary. So we looked at the system in this way. 
But we can, uh, so we are working in the Euclidean signature space. So there is no distinction between time and space. Uh, we can regard any direction as a time direction, and we can regard any direction as a space direction. So uh, we can see this uh, system in this way. So in this uh, interpretation of the manifold, now this tau direction is a Euclidean time direction. And this W is a time slice. So this is a constant, uh, this is a time slice at tau equal zero. So this, this is uh, tau equal zero. So we can see the system in this way. Then we can interpret the path integral in a different way. So the path integral on uh, y gives uh, uh, actually a state vector. Ah, oh, sorry. This is W. So the path integral was originally introduced to compute uh, amplitudes, transition amplitudes uh, from one time to another time, initial time to final time. And so, so because we are looking at uh, this tau as a time coordinate, uh, this manifold y, uh, so if we perform the path integral on y, then we get the amplitude. But uh, in this manifold, uh, there is no initial time. And there is only this final time. So this is, uh, I mean, this is similar to, I mean, Hartle Hawking's uh, creation of the universe from nothing. But uh, I'm not discussing quantum gravity. So here, the metric is just a uh, background field. This manifold is just a background manifold. Uh, but we can still consider it as a, a transition amplitude from uh, nothing, empty space, uh, to W. Then in this interpretation, uh, this uh, path integral gives a state vector on W. So here, this HW is a Hilbert space. On W. Okay, and also I imposed this boundary condition and this boundary condition can be also seen as a state vector. So this L, boundary condition L, this also gives a state vector uh, which I denote by this uh, ket L. I don't explain the details of this uh, state, but we can characterize this uh, state very explicitly in canonical quantization formalism. But I don't uh, use any explicit, uh, I mean, explicit realization of this state. I just use the existence of this state. Then uh, the path integral, the result of the path integral on y with boundary condition L can be written as an inner product between uh, this state L and this uh, state ket y. So uh, this part partition function can be seen in this way. And for the computation, there is another important uh, point. 
near the boundary of the manifold, uh, I so this neighborhood of the boundary is just a product of some interval times W. So near the boundary, so we have this, uh, okay, I take, ah, uh, sorry, zero, and I assume, say some epsilon. Then the neighborhood of the boundary is just a product between interval and this W. So I assumed this uh, yesterday. Then the path integral on this region uh, is uh, described by a time evolution. So, so the path integral on this interval corresponds to the, this uh, Euclidean time evolution. So here this H is the Hamiltonian of the massive fermion system. And this epsilon is the length of this interval. So uh, the path integral on this region is equivalent to this uh, time evolution operator in the Euclidean space. And this operator uh, goes to the prediction operator to the ground state. Here this uh, ket omega, this is uh, the ground state. So uh, we have a massive fermion theory. And because we are taking the mass to be very large, uh, this theory has a very large mass gap. So uh, all excited states are suppressed under this uh, Euclidean time evolution. And so in the limit that this epsilon times mass parameter goes to infinity, all excited states uh, decay under this uh, time evolution, and only the ground state survives. Then, uh, then in this uh, infinite mass limit, uh, this state, ket y, is proportional to the ground state uh, because uh, we have this region, which is represented by this time evolution, and then we get this uh, projection. So, so this is proportional to the ground state. Now we can use this property to compute this uh, uh, partition function. So this is given by the inner product between this uh, bra L and get y. And because this y is proportional to the ground state, uh, we can insert uh, this projection to the ground state, and then we get this. So now we can separate the uh, contribution from the boundary and the bulk. So this uh, contribution, so this is a uh, inner product between this uh, boundary state and the ground state. So this is uh, completely determined by on the boundary. So this is, we can interpret it as a contribution from the boundary. And on the other hand, uh, this uh, inner product uh, between this uh, ket y and bra omega, this is just determined by the property of the bulk. And this does not depend on what boundary condition we impose. So we can interpret it as a contribution from the bulk. So we can separate the boundary contribution and the bulk contribution. Uh, but this separation is not complete because uh, so 
in this separation, we needed to introduce this ground state, but the phase of the ground state is uh, not canonically determined. So this ground state has a phase ambiguity. And in particular, this, um, this system ha has a very phase. So there is no canonical way to determine the phase of the ground state. Okay. Anyway, uh, up to the phase ambiguity, we can separate the boundary contribution and the bulk contribution. Oh, excuse me? Yes. Could you, could you say again about the very phase parts? So why uh, I it did, didn't explain it at all, but- um, Oh, thanks. I, yeah, I, if, uh, yeah, we can compute the very phase of this uh, ground state when we change the background phase. So for example, if, if we have a, a U1 symmetry, yeah. then yeah, I'm assuming that I put a U1 gauge field and then uh, uh, I can change the background U1 gauge field and this ground state gets a phase, uh, very phase under the change of the background field. And in fact, uh, we can, for example, we can reproduce uh, uh, I I forgot the name. K K L T. No. T K K. T. Sorry. Yeah. I mean, it's a famous very phase which appears in integer quantum system. Solus Komoto. You mean? Ah, yeah, 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 yeah. Yes. Solus Solus Komoto. Komoto. Yes. Yes. Yeah, that phase was usually computed in momentum space. But yeah, it, maybe yeah, here but, is the transcendence action. Yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, yeah, yes, yes. Yeah, uh, yeah we can reproduce that very phase computation uh, from the point of view of this uh, ground state on, on background fields. And yeah, we can actually really uh, reproduce the same result. Thanks, thanks, thanks. Yeah. I'm sorry, can, can I make a second question? Mm -hmm. uh, 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 there is, uh, maybe I misinterpreted something, but uh, the ket, the, the y uh, ket, right? It, it does belong to, to a Hilbert space in, in a D plus one dimension state, and L is a basis, uh, I'm confused whether you, you can always, if we, if we have made some input regarding that we already know that this uh, D plus one massive fermion mm -hmm. uh, can be reinterpreted in terms of uh, a massless fermion in, in D, because I, 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 it would naively seem to me that you have in your last equation uh, put the, the, same, the same state, the same vacuum state, uh, um, uh, bracketed with things that should belong to different Hilbert spaces. Am I making myself clear or not? Okay, so let me go back to this one. So, uh, so yeah, originally, so we regarded this W as a spatial boundary, and then we have a localized fermion here. But now I changed the interpretation uh, in this way. So this, so now this W is just a, a time slice. And now there is no spatial boundary uh, on this W. So we can just consider- oh, Okay, okay. so we are, always, we are always dealing with the same Hilbert space in, in this new picture. That was, that was what I am fearing. Because if you have yeah. a theory in D plus one, and then you have a second theory on D, those Hilbert spaces, should not be the same. But in this interpretation, one is preparing the hartle hogan wave function and the other one is just a basis at a, at a t, fixed t, so everything is okay, in a sense. Yeah, yeah, okay, yeah. Okay, so, this yeah, yeah. my question. I, I, think I, saw it, I think I saw it with your comment. Thank you. I, I, I got confused for a second. Uh, okay. Thank you, thank you. Yes, thank you. Yeah, 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 so, yeah. Okay, so, yeah, maybe I, I should emphasize that yeah, so in this new interpretation, I'm 
only discussing massive fermion. And so this, this is a this is a Hilbert space of the massive fermion, which is uh, defined on this W. So, so we can imagine uh, performing canonical quantization of the massive fermion on this W. And so because this W does not have any boundary, so maybe I should write it. So it doesn't have any boundary. So then uh, this is a Hilbert space of just a massive fermion. And there is no massless mode in this Hilbert space. And the pass integral on this gives a state vector here. Yeah, maybe maybe my question is better posed in the following way. Uh, L, this, this L gets, you cannot expand any state in the Y hill in the HW Hilbert space in terms of L, right? You would miss some, there are other states that are not linear combinations of L. L is just a state, but you cannot expand state. It's not a basis in that sense. And this L, um, not a bit, yeah, I, I mean, so this, yeah, this is, so this L is, Something similar to uh, some, I, I mean. Okay, it's a particular in, state. Okay, it's a particular yeah, yeah, state. In, okay. Yeah, yeah. In quantum mechanics, we can consider some state which is localized on some infinite position. Uh, this area is something similar to that. Uh, yeah, so, I mean, so. Thank you, it, thank you very anyway, much. So, yeah, yeah. So, this area is also. A, state vector of the massive fermion theory. Yes. I think there's some question on chat. Is the ground state always non-degenerate? Ah, yes, yes. Uh, actually, the ground state is uh, non-degenerate. So that can be seen by performing uh, explicit canonical quantization of the system on W. And uh, sorry, I didn't. Shows that the canonical quantization, but yeah, by quantizing the fermion on W, we can see that the ground state is just isolated and all other states are, uh, uh, I mean, very excited. Yes. <clears throat> Thank you. Okay, so, so I separated the contribution from boundary and bulk. Now I can study the dependence of this partition function on Y. So let's take another manifold, Y prime. And which has a, the same boundary. Then uh, to study the dependence on y, uh, I compute the ratio of the partition function between uh, the partition function on y and partition function on y prime. So this y prime and y have the same boundary, but the bulk is, uh, bulk, their bulks are different. So let's uh, compute this quantity. Then, so by looking at this expression, we can see that uh, this boundary contribution is just determined by the boundary. So this is common to both partition functions. So this part cancels out and uh, we get, uh, this result. And uh, I forgot to say that, uh, so let's, let's assume that uh, the absolute value of this inner product is equal to one. So, sorry, I don't explain this point, but uh, yeah, it, it is possible to show this explicitly. 
Uh, but the reason for this is that uh, the bulk is almost empty. So there is no degrees of freedom in the bulk. Uh, I mean, so because uh, the bulk has a very large mass gap. So uh, in the large mass limit, uh, there's no degrees of freedom in the bulk. So uh, the bulk theory is kind of trivial. So this condition implies that uh, the bulk is trivial. But the bulk is not completely trivial. This contains some phase. And that phase ambiguity is the point of anomalies. Uh, but anyways, for simplicity, of discussion, let me assume this. Then, so this is now given like this. And again, I use the fact that uh, this state Y is proportional to the ground state. Then uh, I can uh, eliminate this projection and I can just write in this way. So this is now uh, inner product between this state Y and state Y prime. And this is actually a partition function on some closed manifold. So let me explain the situation. So we have this uh, manifold Y with boundary W. And uh, we also have some another manifold, maybe with different topology. So I call this W prime, uh, but the boundary is the same. Then we can glue them together uh, uh, like this. So along their common boundary. Then we get the uh, Manifold which has no boundary. So I call this as YC, Y closed. So this has no boundary. Its boundary is empty. And uh, we can interpret it, this uh, inner product as a partition function on this uh, closed manifold YC. So in this way, uh, we get the formula uh, of the ratio of partition to partition functions. So the ratio of partition function on y and y prime is given by the partition function of the bulk theory on yc. So this is a very general formula for the uh, anomaly. And in the discussion, I didn't even use uh, the properties of fermions. I just assumed that the ground state is uh, isolated. And so, so there's only a non-degenerate ground state, and all other states are uh, very excited. There's a very large mass gap. Then under that assumption, I have derived uh, this uh, equation. So actually, so this formula describes uh, very general anomalies of any theory. So we can consider not only fermions, but also other, uh, other theories, such as chiral p form fields or uh, something like that. And then uh, if, if this uh, partition function on yc is equal to one for any uh, closed manifold, then that means that uh, this partition function does not depend on the choice of the bulk. So this partition function y and y prime are the same. So 
we can use this partition function for the definition of the chiral fermion uh, partition function. So I define the chiral fermion partition function uh, by this uh, bulk partition function with the boundary condition L. So this is very defined because, uh, because this right-hand side does not actually depend on the choice of Y. So this partition function only depends on the choice of W. So it, it is reasonable to regard this as a partition function on the D-dimensional uh, space. So in this way, we can define the chiral fermion uh, partition function. So this is possible uh, if uh, no, no, uh, uh, I'm just repeating what I already wrote, but <laughs> hmm. Okay. okay. So, so we see that uh, this bulk partition function is G anomaly. So if this is equal to one, there is no anomaly. And if this cannot be uh, taken to be one, then, then there might be anomaly. Uh, actually, there is some, still some freedom to modify this uh, partition function, but uh, maybe I don't have time to explain that point. So, okay, so, so I gave a, an abstract discussion. And uh, I, I still need to give some abstract discussion. Uh, so this bulk theory, so this bulk theory is called invertible field theory. So, so this uh, invertible field theory is characterized by the property that uh, so dimension of the Hilbert space is always just equal to one. So this means that there is only the ground state. On any uh, manifold doubling, uh, which has no boundary. No spatial boundary. So if there is no spatial boundary, the ground state is isolated. So this is a property which characterizes uh, this invertible field theory. So this terminology often appears in the recent literatures on anomalies and uh, uh, topological phases. So the uh, fact that the ground state is one dimension means that uh, there is no uh, degrees of freedom. So this theory is almost trivial. Invertible field theory is uh, almost trivial. But uh, the partition function may be uh, non trivial. And in the case of massive fermion theory, uh, 
そうマッシブフェルミオンあビカムスインバーティブルフィールドセオリーフィン、ウィテイク、イスマスパラメータ、トゥ、ディ、インフィニティ。ケ、okay, ー、ナウ、レットミーコンピュート、レットミーコンピュートディス、バルクパーティションファンクション、オンクローズドマニフォールド、インザケースオブザマッシブフェルミオン。So, this、uh, partition function, so this was an important quantity for anomaly. So, this is given by,、uh, so I wrote that、uh, this is given by determinant of t slash plus m divided by、uh, this p a u l i b i l a s regulator. And、uh, for simplicity, Uh, I assume that uh, this uh, the absolute value of the physical mass parameter is equal to the p a r i b i l a s mass parameter. So, anyway, we take both of them to、uh, infinity. So, I take physical mass to infinity and p a r i b i l a s mass to infinity. And then、uh, I take them to be just equal. But the sign of this、uh, physical mass parameter is very important. So for m negative, so this is an interesting case. So if this m is negative, so this partition function is、uh, okay. maybe I should write again. So this is given by d slash minus capital M. Divided by d slash、uh, plus m. And this is equal to the infinite product. So this is equal, equal to infinite product over eigenvalues of the Dirac operator. So this Lambda is the eigenvalue. I can buy this all with the d i r e c t operator. And we notice that.、Uh, Each factor in this infinite product is. So each factor has absolute value one. So this is a pure phase. So I define this phase as exponential minus 2 pi i s lambda.、Uh, here, this s lambda is、uh, defined to be the. Uh, the phase. So it's the argument of this argument of this ratio minus i lambda minus capital M minus i lambda plus capital M. So this is a pair phase. And so I define the,、uh, this S lambda in this way. Uh, and just as a convention, I take this argument to be between minus pi and、uh, plus pi. I take this argument in this region. This is just my convention. So、uh, it doesn't matter、uh, how we define this argument, but I just need to set some convention. Okay. And this、uh, 
This lambda uh, goes to uh, the sine of lambda. So sine of lambda means this one. You can check uh, this uh, so this limit uh, from this uh, expression. Yeah, you can just uh, check by yourself. So I just use uh, this fact, uh, and also just by convention, I take this sine of uh, lambda zero as plus one. This is again just a convention. Then the uh, sum of this uh, S lambda over all eigenvalues of the Dirac operator is uh, so this, this, I mean, this goes to. So like this, um, maybe I forget to put one half here, sorry. And this uh, is the definition of the uh, adiapathy Dishinga data invariant. Yeah, I should write it more clearly. So this eta invariant is defined to be the sum of the sign of the eigenvalue of the Dirac operator uh, with some regularization. So this is an infinite sum. So to make this uh, infinite sum uh, very defined, uh, we need some regularization, but regularization is, in this case, naturally done by this uh, Harry Dillard's uh, regularization. Uh, but uh, in fact, Harry Dillard's regularization is uh, not uh, not the regularization of which mathematicians use, but uh, I believe that there is no problem about this discussion. So anyway, so. So we define this data invariant. So this is the Atia Patodi Shinga data invariant. By using this data invariant, uh, this bulk partition function is given by exponential minus two pi i eta. Okay, so uh, this, so I was computing this uh, partition function and it is uh, given by this infinite product and the product can, so this product is given by, so uh, this infinite sum, and this is a eta invariant. So this was the definition. So finally, I get this result for the massive fermion. So this is a result for negative mass. And for positive mass, uh, it's very easy to compute the partition function on positive mass. Uh, so this is just given by the, uh, the ratio, this ratio. And because I took uh, the physical mass to be the same as the power bilas mass, uh, so this is completely trivial. This is just equal to one. So let me summarize uh, what I got.
So in the mass parameter, M is negative. Uh, I get the boundary chiral fermion. So there's localized chiral fermion on the boundary. And in the bulk, uh, I get the non-trivial uh, partition function given by the eta invariant. Okay, so the boundary degrees of freedom is non-trivial, and also the bulk partition function is non-trivial. And this yet invariant corresponds to the anomaly of this localized mode. But on the other hand, uh, when the mass parameter is positive, then there's no localized mode. And the partition function is trivial. So this uh, case of massive, uh, ah, sorry, uh, positive mass parameter is completely trivial. So in this way, uh, there is a correspondence between the bulk and the boundary. And so uh, this. Uh, so this is the general formula for uh, anomalies of fermions. And for, uh, for myelin fermions, uh, the result is just uh, one half of this uh, Dirac case. So in the Majoran case, instead of uh, minus two pi i eta, uh, uh, we get minus pi i eta. So, so let me just say this. Okay, so anyway, so this, so in this way, we get this uh, general formula for the fermion anomalies. And I'm almost running out of time, but uh, so yeah, let, let me very quickly uh, show some examples. Uh, for example, uh, if we take uh, p plus one equal to, and if we consider uh, bulk massive myelin fermion with ON symmetry, uh, then on the boundary we can we get uh, some uh, one dimensional uh, fermions which have uh, anomalies under this. And for example, if we consider S2 with some non trivial uh, ON bundle, or here I, I show an example of SO, topologically non trivial SO3 bundle, then uh, it turns out that the result of this uh, data invariant is given by minus one. So this shows the existence of a non-trivial anomaly. And this reproduces the anomaly uh, which I discussed before by, uh, by the traditional approach. So this is a anomaly of uh, equal one uh, myelin fermions with ON symmetry. So this is one example. Uh, and uh, in the same way, uh, for example, if we take D to three, so D plus one equal four, and if we consider fermion with SUN symmetry, then the partition function on S4 with an instant on number turns out to be given by this. So the eta exponential of the eta invariant is given by minus one. And in this case, uh, it is called the pi T anomaly. And um, okay, in the same way, if we consider d equal to four, so d plus one equal to five, and I take the uh, SU two symmetry, and if we 
we consider some manifold, some five dimensional manifold, then uh, by computing this yet invariant, we get minus one. And this uh, reproduces the Witten SU2 anomaly in four dimensions. So, this Witten SU2 anomaly, anomaly is very famous, and this was first obtained by a traditional approach. So, th this was the first example of global anomaly. Uh, but now, uh, by using this uh, general formula, uh, we can reproduce the uh, Witten SU2 anomaly. Uh, um, Yes. And the computation of the Yeta invariant is actually not so easy. So there is no straightforward way to compute the Yeta invariant. And uh, so usually it's hard to compute, uh, but there is some mass technology such as uh, Bodhism. Uh, and generalized cohomology, spectral sequences, and so on. So by using these techniques, uh, uh, sometimes we can compute this uh, yet invariant. Sometimes it, it's still difficult. Uh, but anyways, uh, in that way, we can determine uh, fermion anomalies. And uh, in my lecture, I just talked about fermions uh, with ordinary symmetry. But of course, we can consider more general theories. Uh, uh, one example is P form field. So, for example, in string theory, in type 2B string theory, we have a uh, four form field which satisfies self dual equation. And that field has an anomaly. And we can also consider more generalized symmetries such as higher form symmetries or higher group symmetries or non-invertible symmetries and so on. So, so what I discussed in my lectures uh, is just a basic thing. So from here, uh, you can go to any direction you like. Okay, uh, that's all. Uh, thank you very much. Well, thank you, Kazuya, for giving us these lectures this week. Um, maybe we should stop recording. Okay, I think I'll uh, pass it on to you, Irene. Um, this is the fourth and last uh, lecture on aspects of the swamp plant. Go ahead. Okay, thank you very much. Um, thank you everyone for uh, coming until the last moment, the last lecture. So I hope you learn some things during these three days and I hope you will enjoy the last one. So yesterday uh, we introduced the weak gravity and the distance conjectures which are at the core of the swamp plan program because they are more useful for phenomenology than the absence of global symmetries but still they are in very solid ground like they are I mean in recent years there are many works that have been testing them. And especially from string theory, uh, we discussed yesterday what is the evidence that we have for the conjectures. I gave you a few examples of um, string theory compactifications in which we always find towers of states at the asymptotic limits, the infinite distance limits, which are super extremal. So they are satisfying both the weak gravity and the distance conjecture. Now, Studying this in string theory gave rise, although I didn't have time to discuss, with many connections with mathematics or algebra, geometry, of Calabillaos, modular properties, and so on, because sometimes they are satisfied in non trivial ways, and there is a lot of research there. Uh, and at the very end, I show you this slide, which was sort of a summary of the evidence that we have at the moment for these conjectures coming from string theory. So the, the cases of Extended supersymmetry are very well understood. And as usual, um, what is left is are the cases with less and less supersymmetry. Also, there are more works in the context of ADSFT, but many more things can be done in the future. So, this is also a very interesting avenue to pursue. Okay, so the plan for today is to 
I mean, yesterday was about the evidence from the state theory. Today, we are going to discuss how one can get a motivation from the weak gravity conjecture independently of string theory, just thinking of black hole physics. Okay, we see that the weak gravity conjecture arises as the kinematic requirement to avoid stable black holes, so that this can be connected to weak cosmic censorship and, and other things. And I will briefly discuss also, I mean, what are some of the main phenomenological implications that it could have, and especially what are the open questions, okay? So since this is, I mean, you are attending lectures of at active topic of research uh, in the moment, I think it's also interesting to point out exactly what are the main open questions that we have, uh, because the more we, the more people we work on this or think about these things using different approaches, the better. And at the, at the very end, uh, we will come back to the map of conjectures that we had. And I will briefly, uh, with a very few words, uh, introduce the, the rest of the conjectures. And if you have any questions or are curious about any of them, you can ask in more detail. Okay. So this is the plan. So let's start with the with gravity conjectures from black holes. Okay. So when we discuss the absence of global symmetries, we um, I told you that there was some heuristic motivation uh, based on black hole physics because if we have a global symmetry, we are going to get a trouble with remnants. Okay, so this is the let me write. So this is the metric for the for a black hole. Okay, and the case of Schwarzschild, okay, of a neutral black hole. Okay, this is the case of neutral black hole. As you can see, the metric. Right, the near horizon geometry only depends on the mass, so it's not sensitive to the global charges. And that's why when we were computing the number of stable states, we had to sum over all possible global charges and masses, and this was infinite. Okay, and this infinity is what gives the, the heuristic motivation that something is wrong, like it's weird not to have thinking with many states about the gravity. Now, how this gets resolved if we have some gauge symmetry, okay, as we are thinking with the weak gravity connection? Well, let me do it more detail now. So this, is, this would be the metric for a Reissner Nordstrom black hole. Okay, so this is a charged black hole, where there are these two horizons that depend on the mass and the gate charge now, okay? So that the near horizon geometry is characterized by both the mass and the gauge charge. Now, this black hole, um, depending on what are the values of the mass and the charge, can be a smooth solution, I mean, it can have just a horizon, or can be a singular, can, be, can have a naked singularity that is not behind the horizon. So this implies that in order to avoid naked singularities, which is also what is called weak cosmic censorship, one requires this extremality bound so that the mass of the black hole has to be bigger than the charge in plan geometry. Okay, this is the extremality bound. To avoid make singularities. And if we count now, as we did with the global symmetry, the number of stable states like remnants below a certain energy scale before it was infinite, but now when we sum, the charge has to be smaller right, than the mass, which means that we only have to consider um, I mean, black holes no, that are uh, sub extremal, so that the charge is more than the mass. So we have to sum up, up, up to this energy scale. And if you do this computation and put that the entropy is just the typical um, result proportional right, to the charge, then you get that the number of states goes as one over the gauge curve. Okay, so as long as the gauge has been is finite, no? so the symmetry is gauged, then there is never an infinite number of remnants. You always have a finite number of states below a certain energy uh, threshold. 
However, right here you can see that this, uh, of course, becomes problematic again if we send the gas cap into zero, right? If we try to restore the, the global symmetry. And then you can wonder, okay, how close can I get to this situation of restoring you know, this global symmetry? Because if the gas capping is very, very small, okay, I don't get infinitely many, but still I get a parametrically large number of remnants. You know? So to, in what moment, I mean, when the, um, I'm going to start violating you know, the like, entropy bounds and so on. Okay, so this happens when we try to restore a very uh, approximate, you know, very nearly exact global symmetry. Okay, so um, this serves as a motivation to show again that when you try to restore global symmetry, maybe something goes wrong. And a way out of this problem is just to say that actually these states that I'm counting are not stable, like that this computation fails because they are going to decay. Okay, so a way out of this is that uh, black holes actually are not, they don't count as uh, stable ones. Okay, so we have to allow the black holes to decay. And this is what the weak gravity conjecture uh, provides. Okay, a, a mechanism, a way that black holes, all the black holes, all the steamer black holes can decay. Okay, so the weak gravity conjecture we are going to derive now is just the kinematic requirement. Okay, to allow black holes to decay. And this is possible if there is indeed a particle to which the black holes can decay. Okay. Okay, so what are the charge and the mass of these particles such that this process is kinematically allowed? Well, if we start with a black hole, let's imagine that we start with a black hole that is extremal. Okay, otherwise we can just let it evaporate until it becomes to the, to the extremal value. This black hole, um, I mean, we could think that it's going to decay. Imagine, let's assume for a moment that we want it to decay just in two black holes. One of them, uh, can have a charge which is smaller than the mass, so this is fine for the in terms of the extremality bound that we had before. But if one has a charge smaller than the mass, the other one, just by charge conservation and energy conservation, mm -hmm. has to have a charge that is bigger than the mass, which would mean that this is not really a, a black hole, this is an X singularity, okay, because it doesn't satisfy the super extremality, this extremality bound. So this is not possible if we don't want to generate next singularities. So to have a smooth semi-classical process, the point is that this state has to be a particle, okay? Because particle do not need to satisfy this extremality bound. Okay? So you can show this as an exercise if you wish. I mean, it's, it's very easy, but I mean, it's just using that the masses are smaller um, yeah, like that energy is conserved, okay? And that the charge is also conserved. You can show what I just told you, that the charge to mass ratio of the extremal black hole that we start with has to be smaller or equal than one of the products, okay? And this is precisely just the, the weak gravity content. Okay, so in order to allow black holes to decay, we need to have a particle with a charge to mass ratio bigger than the charge to mass ratio of the extremal black hole on the inner. Okay. Okay, any question? Um, yes, I have uh, maybe maybe a couple. Um, so first, in you know, in, in there are lots of cases in which we um, do have to take into account states even if they do decay right so in qcd for example we would we would uh, account for the rho mesons and the loops or, or things that have very short lifetimes so it's not clear to me that even if these black holes can decay if if they are stable for a reasonable amount of time we we still have to sum over them no the thing is that if they don't okay 
it's like when you are summing, for example, running particles in a loop, right? What particles are running there? I mean, it's true that you also have to consider resonances, but to what extent? I mean, if the resonance is very unstable, like the, the lifetime is smaller than the, the scale of the process that you are detecting, it doesn't really count, right? Like the, it doesn't make sense to consider it anymore because otherwise we, we would always sum over infinitely many states, right? Because we always have like infinitely many multi-particle states that are very unstable. Um, that would violate any, like it would always give us an infinite, not in all the computations that we do in quantum computer. So what we actually do is that we have we compare like the lifetime of those particles, mm -hmm. the process that we are considering. And only if the resonance is sufficiently long-lived, long then enters into the computation. Um, so here is kind of the same, like they need to be sufficiently long-lived to enter into the computation, for example, of loop computations to the graviton and see if hey, you are Einstein yeah. gravity down or not. But so um, it's, but precisely, it's it's not clear to me that these things would have a short lifetime. In 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 fact, like I would I would feel like that they would have a long lifetime. Yeah. So it depends on the the thing is um, for the black holes. It's true that the yeah even if you have a weak gravity particle, a very large black hole can still be quite long lived. Um, but I think when you do then the computation, I mean, since it's a black hole, you also have a suppression with the entropy and so on. So I think the problem only appears like that if you really have like infinitely many of them that you have to count over them. Like as long as they are short lived, since you have all this suppression of the entropy, they will not really dominate all the, the scattering processes and so on. Like you have to, to fight with that. Um, so it's like, even if they have, let me say, since you have this E to the S suppression, like yeah. with entropy, unless they are, I mean, even if they are long lived in the sense that they have an exponential, like the, the K rate is exponentially suppressed, uh, you already have this exponential suppression before. I mean, it's like, it's less dominant that if you do the same for particles. Uh, so that's why, like, if you do the computation nicely, I mean, sort of uh, makes sense. Still, I mean, uh, I agree that it's not like very quantitative. Uh, it's just like a way out. Yes. Okay, I mean, at least if they are unstable, I see a way out. No, that there is no no problem. Mm, and also, let me yeah, also I think this lifetime, this lifetime is the gates coupling. Okay, one well, should also check how the lifetime changes when the gates coupling goes to zero. No? That is when the number of them increases. Yes. Um. But then, so, I mean, if you consider the extremal black holes, for example, these things have Hawking temperature zero. So I would, I mean, classically they're, well, like semi-classically they're stable in that sense. So even, I mean, if you had an extremal black hole with a lot of charge or even though there is an electron in nature, it's not going to, I mean, semi-classically we don't. Well, it's, it's just, it's just in their effect. So what I'm describing here, indeed, in okay. like Hawking evaporation, is swing yeah. their effect. Okay, so even if they have zero temperature, I mean, this decay mode yeah. is semi classical. You can compute the instanton uh, and you can show that indeed you have a, an exponential suppression, uh, but that can compensate with the, with the entropy because both depends on the gauge coupling. And it happens at the semi classical and, level. And uh, finally, can I ask um, the entropy? So for the for the global case, um, the counting of the entropy summed over all these uh, global charges that could exist in the black hole, but a faraway observer was blind to this. Um, but for the for the gauge uh, charge, um, it technically isn't every single charge part of a different ensemble, because you can distinguish, even if you have many, many charged states, they don't sort of contribute to the same entropy, right? Each one of them is, uh, in a different ensemble. You mean when doing this competition, summing over the, the remnants? Like... Yeah, so I mean the entropy for a black hole with, with, yeah, with a certain, so I mean, I'm just saying in the global case, there was mm -hmm. this huge entropy because we couldn't yes. count global charges on the black hole. So any global charge contributed to the same ensemble. But yeah. when you have charge, we can distinguish the charges of these things. So 
So it's not really you the same to... type of entropy problem. So you have to, okay, it depends, yeah, how, how you're doing the computation and what type of ensemble are you considering and so on. Um, here I'm taking a very, yeah, like, it's like I'm saying just that the number of states, um, I mean, and I intuitively, right, if you have a different state, I mean, even if you think they are decoupled and you wonder how, what should I put here, like, I mean, how to count of the entropy and so on. Like, if you have different states with different charges, right, like, it's like each of them will be a different state running the loop. Yeah. And you are going to get into many. Yeah, um, no, I agree. I agree with that. But, but just I, like an entry. Sorry, go on. No, no, I, I, see, I think I see your point, like how, I mean, explicitly, no, try to compute it, like what example, ensemble to choose, and then what is the entropy separation and everything. Yeah. That should appear. So, I, yeah, I, I guess I agree that they still, there's still many states in the loops, of course, mm -hmm. because if you, if you have more and more charged states, but, um, so I agree with that argument, but in terms of entropy arguments, I, I don't, I just feel like even though there are many, many states, all of these are distinguishable because we can distinguish charge, like gauge charge I mean, they are states. Not, I don't think they are distinguishable in the sense that there's no way from far away to measure what is the charge, right? You can wonder distinguishable in the sense of how to enter in the computation, but not distinguishable in a physics way. And, and there is no experiment that can distinguish that. Well, can't, can't I just measure the charge of an object with uh... You cannot measure the global charge of a black hole or a part No, but this is gauged. This is gauged ah, charge. Ah, the gauge case, sorry. I, I yes, in the gauge sense. sense. Okay, yeah. sorry. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I guess I'm saying, yeah, there, there still is this problem of too many states and loops, but there's not the same kind of entropy problem, it seems to me, as in the global case, because okay. you can distinguish can these things. Go. So... Um, okay, I'm going to tell you something um, new that has not been published yet, uh, <laughs> but <laughs> maybe I already advertised it. So um, I was worried about the same type of things uh, because it's true, it's a bit like how we um, I think it's possible to make this much more quantitative and precise if you think of that small black hole in the sense that uh, whenever you have a gauge theory and you have gauge and you have some, some black holes, you can also construct small solutions, right? Like the, the area is going to zero as the gauge capping goes to zero. Mm -hmm. And then if you apply this argument there, you can do it quantitatively, quantitatively imply, I mean, like requiring that the Bekenstein bound is not violated, like really putting an upper bound on the, on the Bekenstein bound. I mean, using the Bekenstein bound to constrain how many states you can really have for these small black holes. But it's very important that they are small because the intuition is that now what's going to happen is that you get, um, since they are small and they are becoming smaller and smaller as the gauge capping goes to zero, you can put many of them in a box of the fixed size. Okay. And this is going to violate the Bekenstein bound unless somehow you manage that the area of the black hole also increases with the charge so that in the end, no, you, there is a maximum number of black holes that you can put. Uh, so I think the point is that all these arguments when we are using just usual rise of non-strong black hole, they don't really give a problem. But when you use these small black holes, they really give a quantitative problem because they are becoming like point-like objects. And you yeah. can show that the way to avoid this is that the cutoff of the theory goes to zero as the gauge coupling. So that effectively okay. they are, the area of the black hole increases in such a way that you cannot have too many states in a box of fixed size uh, that would violate the bucket from bound. So by, um, by small, like, what do you mean precisely? Small, small I mean that there are some solutions. Um, they are called small black hole because the area of the black hole actually um, goes to zero, like come in the extremal limit. Okay, sure. Like as the same way the temperature goes to zero. Yeah, but I mean, this is probably not so right. The, the area is still fine in the extremal case, right? Like the one you have. Yeah, a, kind of, yes, yeah, yeah, sorry. You have a finite area, like a finite entropy, because you have that is proportional to the charge. But you can also have solutions 
uh, that are not of that type. Uh, and that's the area actually goes with you in the extrema limit. And this really gives rise to problems. Okay. Um, I think you have to use these other solutions to properly do these computations quantitatively. Okay. Anyway. <laughs> okay. Yeah, thanks. Sorry. I, I, I took a lot of time. Go ahead. It's fine. Um, yes. It's difficult for me to argue more quantitatively for this without using the small black holes. That's why. <laughs> but it was a bit too much for the lectures. <laughs> okay. So let me. Okay. Let me move on. So. Okay. So this is the weak gravity conjecture. This was actually. Um, one, I mean, the original motivation in the original paper, uh, together with the absence of global symmetries. Okay, so we had the two things. And the fact that this was what people were obtaining in string theory as well. Okay, so it was a kind of a combination of all these uh, things. Now, let me, I want to say two more things about the with gravity, and then I will just move to the open questions and the theme implications. So, one thing I want to say is that, okay, I was just um, talking about the vanilla case of just particles and one gauge field. But of course, this can be, this has to be generalized when you have many gauge fields or extent objects. So let me just explain how it generalizes. Okay, so when you have more than one gauge field, if you want to allow all the holes to decay, it's not enough to have one particle for each gauge field independently. You need to satisfy this convex hole condition. Okay, so that if you, um, yeah, if imagine that we have two gauge fields, okay, so we are going to have a charge to mass ratio under one of them and charge to mass ratio under the other one, then the other gauge field. Um, imagine that the extremal region, I mean, if we don't have a scalar field, the extremal region is just going to be a ball in this plane, okay, so that the black holes live inside because they need to have a mass you know, that is larger than the charge because of the extremality bound. So this is the extrema region for the black holes. And now you need to require that if you have some particles you know, that are charged in the gauge fields, the convex hole of this particle okay, includes this extrema region. Okay? Because otherwise, I mean, if you just have one, let's take another color. Um, if you have one here and another one here that are saturated in the with gravity conjecture for the two gauge fields, this is going to cut right, this extremal region. And therefore, a black hole in this diagonal is not going to be able to decay. Okay, so you need that the convex hole for the particles includes the, the extremal region. Okay, this is the general condition. Uh, if you, I put here also an exercise that you can do, which is that starting with a new one gauge field and one particle, okay, that satisfies the gravity conjecture. One can show by dimensional reaction in a circle that the theory in one dimension more does not satisfy the gravity conjecture unless we started with more than one particle at the beginning. Okay, so if we start only with one particle. Uh, you can compute, I mean, when we reduce in a circle, now we are going to have two gauge fields, the original one, but also the KK photon. Okay. And we are going to have the particle and all the KK copies, no? the kaluza klein copies of this particle. But each of them, so it's going to be charged under the original one, but also the KK photon. I mean, all these KK copies are going to be charged under the KK photon. And if you, I mean, I mean, you compute what is this and just using dimensional reaction, one can show that the convex hole is not satisfied uh, in general. Okay. So, I mean, it can be satisfied if this charge mass ratio is very, very super extreme, but there is always some moment in which, even if you are satisfied with gravity conjecture in the arena theory, you do not satisfy it in lower dimensions. So, this was um, an exercise that was actually used to, to motivate the fact that. It's not enough to have just one particle satisfying the gravity conjecture. If originally you start uh, with a tower of weak gravity states in the original theory and you dimension reduce, then you will autom automatically satisfy the weak gravity conjecture under dimensional reaction. So, this, yeah, this is a way to motivate that 
we need to have towers of states of the standard gravity conjecture, which is indeed what we obtain from all the string theory examples. Okay. So the black hole motivation only motivates for one, but consistency and their dimensional reduction and string theory examples give you a motivation for having not just one, but infinity. Okay. Okay. Now, the other generalization I wanted to say is just that, okay, of course, uh, this should be, this should hold for any P form rich field, not necessarily about particles, uh, but one form rich fields. And in that case, what you need is that you need to have some electrically charged P minus one brain with a charge over the tension that is bigger than the charge over the tension of the C my black pair. And this is going to be some order one factor that one can compute uh, explicitly uh, given the, the EFT. Okay, okay. now, um, if we have massless scalar fields, I want to remark that this order one factor, I mean, this gamma, this extremality factor, depends on the scalar fields. Okay? Which means also that this convex hole condition, I mean, this extrema region is not a ball, can be an ellipsoid, or can be straight lines, I mean, can have different shapes depending on the scalar fields. Okay, it's something that given your EFT, you have to compute what is the, the extremal value for the black holes or black brains in your theory, and that will tell you what is the weirdity context that you have to satisfy. Okay? So, what is the charge to And just to give you an example, if you will have some dilatonic theory in the sense that we have some gauge fields whose gauge kinetic function is parameterized by some scalar in this exponential form, which is the typical one at the weak atom points. Then this gamma, in general, is given by this dilatonic couple, this alpha, square over 2 plus p, where p is the p form of field, d, where d is the dimension minus p minus two will be minus two. Okay, this is the formula. So this is like the gravity contribution that we have usually, uh, and this is the dilatonic, the scalar contribution. Okay. okay, so something that I wanted to point out is that without scalars, if we don't have massive scalars, sometimes, I mean, we say that the good gravity conjecture is like a repulsive force condition. Right? Because saying that the charge has to be bigger than the mass uh, is equivalent to the fact that the, the gauge force over this particle will be bigger than the gravitational force. Okay? And actually, if you require this, you get the same order one factor that you get for the, the mariti bound. Okay? So it's not just qualitatively, like quantitatively, it's exactly the same. And that's why we have this name. Like, that's why it's it's called the weak gravity conjecture, no? because then gravity is the weakest force. Okay, and requiring that gravity is the weakest force is equivalent to say that you have a charge to mass ratio part uh, particle with a charge to mass ratio bigger than the extremal value. Now, this correlation between extremality and repulsive force condition does not work in the presence of scalar fields. Okay, it's no longer true. Uh, that this we will get the same numerical factor if we compute the extremality bound in the presence of massive scalar fields, but if we compute this order one factor by requiring that the sum of the repulsive forces is bigger than gravity. So that gravity is always the weaker force. However, uh, this difference between the two seems to always disappear. for the towers of states that we get at the weak coupling gates. Okay? So it doesn't disappear in general for any value of the gauge coupling, but when we take the limit of small gauge coupling, like going to these infinite distance limits, the two conditions coincide okay? and are the same. Okay, so that's uh, this scalar contribution here becomes equal to this scalar contribution to the extremality bound. And that's interesting because the one in the repulsive force condition depends on how the mass behaves, okay? How the, 
because this scalar contribution goes of like the derivative of the mass over the mass. So it depends on how the mass behaves in terms of the mass of the scalar field, where the thermality bound depends on how the gauge coupling behaves. Okay, so this alpha is like the derivative of the gauge coupling over the gauge coupling, exponential rate. So at the weak coupling points, we obtain that both coincide, which means that in, indeed the exponential rate for the mass is equal to the exponential rate of the gauge coupling. And this is why also the, the exponential rate for the distance conjecture, no, how the mass goes to zero exponentially, what is the exponential rate? It can be determined in terms of the extremality bound as well. It's going to coincide with the value uh, for the extremal, uh, like the dilatonic contribution for the extremal backwards. Okay, so the, in the asymptotic limits, the weak coupling limit, the distance conjecture exponential rate can be fixed by extremality bound. Okay, so this is nice because the, I mean, the weak gravity conjecture has a very nice thing, which is that there are no order one factors free. I mean, everything is fixed in terms of these extremality bounds. The distance conjecture had this factor, which was free, which is the exponential rate. But whenever we have a gauge coupling that goes to zero asymptotically and we have the tower that is satisfying both conjectures at the same time, the exponential rate of this tower is also fixed by the extremality bound of the lag. Okay, so there is no difference in those cases. Okay, any question? There's a couple of questions in the chat on, I, I think, things you mentioned quickly, but maybe you can address them. Uh, yes, yeah, sorry. Um, there was a question that I didn't see, which was, if there is a finite gauge coupling and so a finite number of remnants, is there a physical problem? The physical problem appears when you send this gauge coupling to zero. And then you get a parametrically large number of remnants. Okay, so at the weak coupling point. So the motivation from remnants for the weak gravity conjecture only comes at these weak coupling points, that therefore you need to have this tau of the state become light. And that's why you combine it with the argument that the host has to decay, and that's more general and is valid for any value of the weak coupling. And how does extreme black hole decay via Swinger effect? Okay, that's the point. Like even if the temperature is zero. Swinger effect uh, is non-zero. Uh, you can compute the decay rate, and it's non-zero if you have a particle with a charge to marry, so bigger than the, than the extremal value. Otherwise, the, this decay mode, the swinger effect, is the decay rate is zero. Okay? If the charge to marry is not, it is not bigger, uh, directly the decay rate is zero if you compute it. OK, any other question? Okay, now you could wonder to what extent we always have gauge couplings asymptotically. It is something that we already discussed. So far, not the string theory samples we have it. We don't know if it's something more general. Okay, very good. So this is all I'm going to say about the weak gravity and the distance conjecture. Okay. So what I'm going to do next is just to tell you very briefly about the canonical implications and then discuss the open questions for these conjectures. Okay, the main open questions. So for the, okay, so phenomenal implications. Okay, so the weak gravity and the distance conjecture are constraining theories that have either very small gauge couplings or very large field ranges, okay, in general. So if you have some vision of standard model proposal that requires one of the two things, you can try to check if these conjectures can tell you something about it or not. So the, the distance conjecture, right, it says that the cutoff, no, the mass of the tower, goes exponentially in terms of the field distance, the geodesic field distance that you travel in the field space when you approach this sinking distance limit, which means that there is an upper bound on the field range that you can describe uh, within an effective field theory of a finite cutoff, okay, which is then given by this. And then the larger the cutoff of the theory you want it to be, so the larger no, the energy of the process you want to describe, the smaller the field range you can accommodate. And for example, for inflation, 
I mean, at least one has to require that the Hubble scale is smaller than the cutoff of the theory, than the quantum gravity cutoff, um, so that you can write the upper bound on the field range in terms of Hubble. And in large field inflation, the Hubble scale is very large. It's close. Uh, it's like a few orders of magnitude below in Planck only. So that's why maybe you have heard that people say that you cannot have transplanting uh, field ranges, okay? Because this logarithmic is going to be like some order one factor, which will depend exactly on what is the Hubble scale and what is the exponential rate exactly. Okay? So that's why it's also very important not to determine the exponential rate. Now, for the in the case of the gravity conjecture, um, there are different implications that you can do. I'm just going to mention one, okay? which is that if we apply the gravity conjecture for actions, I mean we can constrain action physics because the action is like a zero form field. Okay? So you could also apply the gravity conjecture there. And what it implies is that you must have some electrically charged state, which is an instanton. Okay. If that charge to mass ratio bigger than one, <laughs> which implies that the action, let me write it when I explain it. So the action is like the mass of the instanton, okay. so this is the Euclidean action. And the decay constant of the action is like the one of the gauge cap. Right. So this is the decay constant, which is the periodicity of the action. And it's like the inverse of the gauge cupping, right? Because um, you can just see, for example, from the Lagrangian, right? The decay constant was multiplied in the kinetic term over one of the, the gauge cupping for this zero form gauge field. So the wheel of the conjecture is telling you that the unit at instant on space find this inequality. So that if you want this instant on, you want to have perturbative control over the instant on expansion. It means that the, the decay constant of the action cannot be transplanting. Okay, and that's why maybe you have heard that transplanting actions um, um, actions are problematic. Okay. Of course, here, I mean, this is just for one um, scalar. So in general, you have multi-field and so on, you have to check uh, whether you satisfy the convex hole condition for all the actions, or I mean, maybe it depends on exactly what are these order one factors, it will be valid or not. So I think the, the conclusion in general, I mean, since transplantian actions are also used for large field inflation, one of the conclusions of all this analysis is that the large field inflation is constrained, okay? It's not correct to say that it's rule out because it depends on the details of the model. You have to check for each model, but at least I mean, it's fair to say that it's constrained because when you have large field ranges or transplantian action, uh, it's very easy that you get into contradiction with this conjecture. Okay. Any question? Okay, so what are the main open questions um, for the conjectures? Okay, so this is what, well, where a lot of research is devoted now, and maybe it will change in the following years, maybe changed by some of you. So let's point out what are the main open questions. So for the weak gravity conjecture, it's very clear. I want to point out what is the most important one, which is who is satisfying the gravity conjecture in the sense of. Do I have just one particle? Do I have infinite many? Do I have these towers? Even if I have the towers, you know, what is the what are the charges? Or what is the minimum charge? So by black hole arguments, let me remark that black hole arguments only motivate like a mild version of the weak gravity in the sense that only one particle is required. Okay, with a mass smaller than the charge. And then you can wonder what is the, the charge of this particle, okay? So how light this particle is going to be, whether it's going to be weak in the effective theory or it's just going to be very heavy. So it doesn't have any effect on the EFT. Okay. 
Now, string theory examples, modular invariance from the CFT, consistency and the dimensional reduction, and so on, motivate that you need to have a tower or a sub lattice uh, of with gravity states. Okay. Um, however, this tower, I mean, even if you have a tower or a sub lattice, um, what is the first, what is the charge of the first state? It's not necessarily one. I mean, you can have a still a tower. And then the main question is what is this index of the tower of the, or the satellite? So again, whether the first state satisfied with gravity conjecture is light enough such that it's within the effective theory or not. Okay. So this is the main open question because the phenomenal implications depend on this. Okay. I mean, if you want to have uh, some phenomenal implication, you need that the weak gravity state is within the effective theory. Okay? Otherwise, you will not be sensitive to it. And there is a lot of research here trying to put lower bounds on these charges. And so far, in, it's true that in all the examples in thin theory, these charges, like this index of the satellites, is always an order one, in the sense that you cannot make, maybe you can make the charge to be two or three or four, but you cannot make it parametrically far large which means that the states are going to impact the EFT, but there is no proof for this yet. Okay. okay. And then for the distance conjecture, um, well, I put several. One is that the, so far, the, for the distance conjecture, so the exponential behavior in terms of the field range, all the evidence comes from string theory or ADS EFT. But there is no like black hole motivation or bottom up rationale of why this should be true. Okay. Uh, so, this is something that is missing. And it's important if we want to argue that this is a general quantum gravity uh, tracing, okay, a quantum gravity constant. So, at some point, I mean, we need to give these general explanations, even if they are not so quantitative, but at least it gives us an intuition of what would go wrong in general if it's not satisfied, and we can then. You see to argue that is independent of string theory. So this is uh, one of the main open questions. Um, also, the exponential rate of the tower, as I say, is very important because this is important to be precise phenomenal implications. So here is recently we got we got some lower bounds uh, from string theory, okay, that are very useful. Um, and also point out that what matters for these lower bounds are, for example, the discrete symmetries that get restored and so on. So I think it's very likely that in, in the next years, we'll get a better understanding of how to derive these, these exponential rates purely from EFT data and maybe how it relates to the global symmetries. Okay. And finally, um, I was mentioning a lot the evidence in terms of, I mean, when we have extended supersymmetry, but of course, to give phenomenal implications, um, we need to have a scalar potential, right? We need to break supersymmetry and so on. And you could wonder what is the fate of this conjecture when you have a scalar potential and you don't move just in a flat model space. So here there are also, we have several words about it. Um, the idea, and just to give you the intuition, is that the distance conjecture as the weak gravity and all these conjectures should be satisfied at any energy scale. I mean, they shouldn't care about what is the energy scale that you are defining the EFT, right? So it should be consistent under the RG flow, which means that if I have a scalar potential, I can always integrate out the heavy modes, right? the, the heavy directions, and focus, for example, on the value of the potential. And this is like my new modular space, right? So the distance conjecture in particular should be satisfied by the values of the potential. And that's why we use it for inflation, because when we move in these values, the potential. Okay. This is by consistency of RG flow. But this is highly non trivial because not every potential that you engineer just randomly is going to satisfy that the value of the potential move is in such a way that the distance context is satisfied. Because imagine that you have a super, very turning trajectory, like some spiral, it seems that you could get a very large field range without having towers of the state that become light. So the distance conjecture itself is already putting constraints on the scalar potentials that are consistent 
is quantum gravity. Okay. So this is something that has to be explored much, much more, but um, it's one of the main open avenues uh, to discuss. And at the moment, as usual, I mean, this has been studied first in the context of free theory. So we have checked that this work in the context of Calabi-Yau manifolds, uh, but we need to have more general uh, evidence. Okay. okay. Any question? Okay. So with this, I finished these two conjectures. Okay. So. Irene. Irene. Is there, is there any preliminary work connecting uh, the, the field uh, range to, uh, to black hole arguments and so on that you, you had there as a question mark, but is there, Yeah. Um, you, don't, you don't have to say if it's not published yet, but <laughs> is there anything out no, there? No, it's precisely the one I told you about small black holes that we will publish. Oh, okay, okay. okay. <laughs> So let me, yeah, so this is the map conjecture that I showed you at the beginning of the lectures. Okay. So what have we done? Okay. So we have discussed um, the absence of global symmetries in great glory. And we have seen how it relates to these other conjectures, which were the continuous hypothesis, which actually it seems it just comes from absence of generalized global symmetries, maybe non-invertible symmetries as well. And this generalization to cover these in classes, okay, which are including topological global charges. Now, then, uh, so all this is about like on the theme of topological operators, no global symmetries and so on. Then we have the, the weak gravity conjecture and the distance conjecture, which is about towers of states that are becoming light when the gauge coupling are small or the distance are very large, such that uh, they are also uh, super extrema no, in terms of the black hole extremity. So this constraints the field spectra. Um, and what is left that I didn't discuss in these lectures are these other newer conjectures. Uh, which can actually derive from consequences of having these towers of states in your field. Okay, so what I'm going to do if I have like five minutes left or ten minutes left is to say a few words about what they are, uh, even if we will not describe them in detail, but I just uh, to mention what they are about. Okay? Um, but just before I want to remark one thing that I have here on the right hand side, uh, which is that um, yeah, I mean, the way to work in the swamp plan is, it depends who you talk to. It's not like just using some techniques to answer many different questions. Like we have some concrete questions that we need to answer and you can approach it in many different ways. And that's good because it's very hard, of course, to prove these conditions because we don't have a complete framework of quantum gravity that we can just, okay, let's check it and that's it. Uh, we are trying to understand quantum gravity in a sense. So we need to approach it in many different ways. and. I want to remark that the first step is identifying the conjectures. I mean, like universal patterns that we think might be general constraints for quantum gravity, but this is only the first step. Okay, so identify quantum gravity patterns and for, that we formulate them in terms of conjectures. Now, the next step, of course, we need to test quantitatively all these conjectures. So. In order to test it quantitatively, we need to take a framework of quantum gravity, and typically then we do this in string theory because it allows you allow us not to test this quantitatively. But then this is also not enough because we want to argue that this is a general quantum gravity principle. So we need to provide some explanation of what would be wrong no, in the EFT if we don't satisfy the conjecture. So why it should hold in general. Here, we cannot prove that it should hold in general because you don't have a quantum gravity completion, but the goal is try to prove it in string theory, in the string theory compactification, and then explain uh, to understand what is the quantum gravity principle underlying. So this is the way we proceed. 
And that's why it's a mixture of working with skin compact applications, but then also using black hole physics, holography, or sensitivity bounce data to give more general uh, explanations. Okay. okay. So, as I said, this is going to be the last slide in which I just want to mention briefly what are the, the other uh, conjectures. So, you can ask me during the discussion, like if you are curious about something in more detail, but let me just define it. So, we had this statement that non supersymmetric vacua are at best metastable. So, that if you don't have supersymmetry, there is no way to protect the vacuum, the vacuum from decay. Okay. This is motivated from the wave gravity conjecture. When you apply to co-dimension one um, brains, because then when the, if the charge to mass ratio is bigger than one, this is equivalent to the stability condition because then you can uh, nucleate a bubble that will expand because the electric force repulsion is bigger than the cost of energy of expanding the bubble. Okay. So this is an stability idea. So that was the original motivation that if you satisfy the gravity conjecture and you have this co-dimension one brain because you have flux seals and so on, then the vacuum will be unstable. But the other motivation now, a posteriori, I mean, the other piece of evidence comes from these bubbles of nothing that we discuss the second day. And it seems to be always topologically allowed, at least if we don't want to require, if we don't want to have this topological global charge, right? If the power is influences. So that's why we have these two lines here. Okay. okay, now we have the all the sitter conjectures that are sometimes the most controversial just because they are the ones that have a biggest phenomenal impact. Um, at the moment, I want to remark that the evidence that we have for this is just that the asymptotic limits, when we go to these infinite distance limits in the modular space, okay, indeed, it seems that there is this always the runaway behavior of the scalar potential, such that it satisfies that the slope is bigger than the potential itself. But this is something that we only have evidence for at the, at the infinite distance limits. Okay. And you can also show that indeed this behavior, this runaway of the potential, is induced by the tower of the states that is becoming it. That's why it's kind of consistent. That is something that appears at the synthetic limit. Okay, so by the tower of the states of the distance condition. So that's why there is this correlation to the distance condition. And finally, the ADS distance conjecture uh, is this, it's a generalization of the distance conjecture uh, that implies that there is a tower of the states uh, whenever that becomes light whenever you take a flat space limit. So like if you are in ADS or in the sitter and you take a limit in which the cosmological constant goes to zero. Flat space limit, you are going to get some tower of states that escapes with the cosmological constant to some power. And this is interesting because understanding well what is this power can set light on whether we can have scale separation in ADS, for example. Okay, so this, if this alpha is bigger than one half, this is the equivalent to say that there is no scale separation, because if you think that this tower is like a Calusa plane tower, uh, and we have ADS cross something, which is just something here, when the mass of the tower is um, smaller or equal than the ADS length, then there is no scale separation between the, the non compact and the compact. So, this is an open question of research. And again, this is motivated from applying the distance conjecture applied in, to the space of metric configurations. Okay? So, instead of, of thinking of distances in the scalar, space, we think of distances in the 
fill space, I mean, the space of other fields, like the metric configurations, okay? And if you do that, then you get this condition. So that's why it's kind of a generalization of the distance convention. Okay, so all these three are, are important because they are telling us information about the landscape of aqua and the structure of the potential and so on. So can, obviously can have many more thermodynamical implications. And they also deal with important questions by themselves, like what are the stability of the vacua, whether we can have the sitter in quantum gravity, or whether we can have scale separation in ideas. But they are, of course, the level of evidence for these three is much, much less than for the previous ones. Okay, and so they are motivated by the previous ones, but whenever you generalize something, I mean, you have to uh, work again harder no? to try to provide general evidence for that. So these are open courses of research. Um, and probably, I mean, it's, this thing is very quickly evolving, so it will also change in the next years. Okay. So any question, maybe, okay, let me, let me just finish and then you can ask any question. So, so this is it. Um, I want to finish with a positive message because I guess I'm a positive person. Uh, I think that if there is a swamp plan and the existence of a swamp plan is good news. I mean, if not everything goes, is good because it means that we can have predictive power from quantum gravity. And the goal is try to determine precisely what are what goes in quantum gravity. So what is the space of consistent EFT if we pick up okay. Because then we can use it to provide new constraints for Fino. Also, because it's interesting by itself, like what are the quantum gravity constraints that we impose, no? Like in the same way that we, we, we already understand this very well for gauge theories and we have anomalies and all these things, what is the equivalent for gravity? You know, like we have to continue improving our understanding of quantum gravity. And it's very promising that uh, quantum gravity has something special that is that can provide this UV IR mix that we don't have in quantum field theory, and that is ex exemplified by some of these conjectures. So something that I find very exciting is whether we can understand better this UV IR mixing from quantum gravity and use it uh, to, to solve the natural issues, for example, that we observe in our universe, like why the cosmological constraints are small, the electro weak hierarchy problem, no? or why neutrinos are so light, and so on. Because it could be some, I mean, all these fine tuning issues and these hierarchy problems have to be revisited if not this, the full space of parameters is allowed. Okay, so whatever things that seem natural from a quantum field theory perspective, maybe are not natural from a quantum gravity perspective, and vice versa. No? Like there are some natural things from quantum gravity that can be very surprising for the EFT, and this is an opportunity uh, to learn new things. So let me finish here. Thank you for your attention. I hope you enjoyed, and let's see if there are more questions. Okay, thank you, Irena. Um, maybe while we digest the last few slides, and I think if we have any questions, let's thank you for uh, giving us these lectures in uh, one form or another. Um, I never, I can never find the, the clapping reaction thing, and then, but uh, yes, here it is. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, so um, are there any questions or comments? Oh, sorry, let me first uh, stop recording. Okay, okay, looks like I yeah, also have the power. So the question is, are there other qualitative tests in other frameworks not seen theory that support energy conditions? Uh, qualitative tests, uh, maybe you mean quantitative? Like, so the, um, okay, let me come back here. So from, I mean, from back of physics right now, I give you like heuristic motivations, but for example, uh, one important work is to connect, I mean, to show that there were some examples um, that were violating weak cosmic censorship, that when you introduce a weak, a particle satisfying the reality conjecture, they are fine again with weak, weak cosmic censorship. So there's a 
interconnection between the two things. And that's quantitative also because it's really, you need the charge to manage a bit bigger than the thermal value to, to satisfy the coefficients of heat. And it's not related to the next singularity. Like, I mean, it's a more complicated thing that you have a, an electric field that grows indefinitely and that would produce some violations. So. From holography, we have, um, as I said, like we have some also, especially evidence for the weak gravity conjecture and proofs in the worksheet or equivalently in ADS3 plus uh, CFT2 using the modular symmetry, the modular invariance of the CFT. Okay, so by modular invariance, we will always generate states that have a charge to mass ratio be, bigger than one. And, and let me say, so there are also other, there are other works from holography like using, well, for example, the absence of global symmetries also has this proof in holography um, using also the locality of the CFT uh, that requires that the global symmetry in the, in the boundary is a gauge symmetry in the bulk. Um, so for global symmetry, we have many of these quantitative tools, but for the weak gravity, it's only these ones. So holography or the cosmic sensor seat. Um, and for the distance conjecture, I mean, we know also that whenever we have a free point, we will also get the tower of higher spin operator. So that's just a quantitative thing. Uh, but yeah, these are the examples we can think of right now. All the rest come from string theory. And there are people now working on the positivity power. So, but this is some work in progress. Uh, we'll see. There are, okay, positivity bounds can also give you argument, I mean, uh, some proofs for the weirdity conjecture, but for a very mild version of the weirdity, okay? Like that maybe small black holes themselves satisfy the weirdity conjecture, but they are not enough at the moment to give you stronger, uh, stronger versions of the weirdity that we have a light particle satisfying. More questions? Can, can I ask perhaps a, a, a quite a dumb question? Um, but so the fact that um, global symmetries are bad and these black hole arguments boils down to the fact that we can't tell from asymptotic uh, space. Are you in your office? I am, I am. I, uh, I very much, I'm very much in favor of offices with a couch. Well, yeah, I mean, the only, Okay, um, maybe I shouldn't share this. The only problem is like, uh, sometimes I'll come in in the morning and one of the one of the janitorial staff clearly enjoys using my couch to take his breaks. <laughs> and every once in a while, I'll find evidence that someone's been sort of hanging out on my couch uh, <laughs> for the evening. But uh, I begrudge no one the chance to sit down and have a rest. <laughs> Okay, are you ready to go if I, if I start this? Yeah, please. Okay, uh, okay let's start uh, recording, please, yes. Um, so we have the fourth and last uh, lecture by Alex Maloney on holography and averaging. Take it away. So um, uh, thanks everyone for coming again today. Um, as always, let me remind you that I encourage everyone to ask lots of questions, interrupt me at any point. Uh, feel free to just unmute yourselves and go ahead and ask a question. Uh, no need to you know, raise your hand or anything like that. Feel free also to write questions in the chat, although of course I can't necessarily monitor that in real time. So you should also just feel entitled to unmute yourself and ask, ask a question uh, right away uh, at any point. So, um, 
Today, what I'd like to do is spend um, our last lecture investigating uh, an example, or I should say a conjectured example of an averaged holographic duality between a theory of gravity in asymptotically ADS-3 spacetimes and an ensemble of two-dimensional CFTs. And as we articulated uh, last time, really in order to formulate an ensemble average over a family of CFTs, we really need to do three things. The first thing we need to do is understand exactly the space of conformal field theories. The next thing we need to do is understand how to define a probability distribution on this space of field theories. And the third thing we need to do is learn how to compute averages over this space of conformal field theories. And those are very hard things to do. We don't know how to do them in general. And so the example I'm gonna talk about today is one where we add tons of symmetry to the problem in order to make it solvable. So in particular, I'll be considering ensembles of 2D CFTs with some central charge that will be equal to some integer that I'll call capital D and with a big symmetry algebra. So in particular, we'll assume that there is a chiral algebra generated by currents that create a U1 to the D times U1 to the D current algebra. Uh, that's a very fancy way of saying something that you already probably uh, know, uh, which is that the theories that we're going to be thinking about with this giant algebra are really just free boson conformal field theories. Okay. So these are free boson conformal field theories in two dimensions, and they will be dual to a somewhat exotic sort of 3D theory of gravity. But it's going to be a theory of gravity where we can compute everything that we would want to be uh, thinking about exactly. So in particular, just to maybe spoil the punchline, one can compute the average partition function. So here, this is going to be the average over the space of CFTs. And this will be the partition function on some general Riemann surface. You can compute this. And what we'll discover is that the result takes exactly the form that you would expect in a three-dimensional theory of gravity. So in particular, you know, it will take the form of a gravitational path integral where we have a sum over classical saddle points. So these will be locally ADS3 geometries with a weighted by some classical action plus a one loop correction. And in principle, a bunch of higher loop corrections. Now the theories of gravity that turn out to appear here are so simple that they're always one loop exact. And so in fact, all of those higher loop corrections will vanish. And so there's a sense in which this is a theory where we can compute all of the perturbative and non-perturbative corrections exactly. And so we can just perform a completely explicit matching on both sides of this duality. So if you like, this is uh, an exactly solvable version of ADS-CFT in the sense that on the gravity side, we have a complete set of saddle points and the complete perturbative expansion around each saddle point. We can sum it all up and we get some CFT answer. Okay. Now, in order to get this exactly solvable theory, we had to sacrifice a lot. I assumed some like huge symmetry group. So this means that this is a very, very simple theory of gravity. In fact, when I say that it's an exotic theory of gravity, I'm not kidding. Uh, it's a theory that in a sense uh, 
looks uh, more like a gauge theory than it does like, uh, you know, Einstein gravity or some genuine theory of fluctuating metrics in higher dimensions. Nevertheless, however, but because it does have the form of a sum over geometries, I do think, um, you know, it is still uh, a rich enough example that we can draw uh, interesting lessons for our understanding of quantum gravity uh, from this example. So that's where we're going today. Um, I, you know, at this point, I'm ready to dive in to some of the details, but maybe before I do so, I'll just pause and see if there's any, any questions or anything that requires clarification. Good. So let's just go ahead and dive in and get started, okay? So let's start by thinking about the example uh, where D is equal to one. That is to say, a free boson with central charge one. So this is a free boson. Let's call it X. And because we want a discrete spectrum, okay, that is to say, we want uh, each of the elements of this ensemble to be a compact unitary conformal field theory. I have to take this to be a compact boson. And so it'll be a boson uh, that lives on some circle of radius R, okay? With the standard action, so with the standard action, that's the integral dx d bar x. Okay? So this will be the world sheet action or the 2D action of a single free boson of radius R. So this has a U1 times U1 current algebra. What are the U1 symmetries? They're just basically translations around the target space circle. Okay? And so here, the space of CFTs is one dimensional, right? Because it's labeled by this parameter R. And the radius R is a coordinate on this moduli space of CFTs that I'll call M sub one. Okay. So, I mean, this is uh, just a very simple space of CFTs, uh, but now we could start trying to average over the space of CFTs. So what sort of quantities might we wanna average? So we would like to average And the, the first thing we have to ask is what sort of quantities do we want to average? So for example, you might wanna average the partition function of the theory. So the partition function of the theory, so let's just think about the torus partition function of a free boson. What is that? So that's the thing that computes the spectrum of the theory. Okay. And for a free boson, uh, this is an easy thing to compute. It's a straightforward exercise. It involves two pieces. There's a one loop determinant coming from the fluctuations of this free boson and a sum over classical saddle points, right? I mean, it, it's a free theory. Free theories are one loop exact. Uh, so if you know the classical saddle points and if you know the one loop corrections, you can compute the partition function of the theory exactly. So here, uh, this theta function is the sum over classical saddle points, which is a sum over momentum and winding modes. So if N is the momentum and W is the winding mode, then the uh, Part theta function that describes the sum over classical saddle points, the sum over classical solutions of a free boson uh, that maps from a torus into a circle, just takes a form that you have probably seen before. I only write it down to emphasize that what I'm doing here is really nothing terribly sophisticated. So here, uh, tau is the modular parameter on my torus, if I'm considering the torus partition function, and I'm writing it as x plus i y. y, if you like, is the inverse temperature, uh, if I wanted to think about this as a thermal partition function, and x would be some sort of angular potential. Okay. 
So that's the piece of this partition function that comes from the sum over classical solutions. And this one loop determinant, well, that's just given by the usual formula that would appear even for a non-compact free boson. So this is the function that counts the descendant states in the theory. So if you like, that theta function that came from the sum over classical saddle points is the thing that counts primary states. And this one loop determinant counts descendant states. And here by descendant states, I mean descendants under the U1 current algebra of the theory, or U1 times U1, which is why we have those absolute values. And so what would we like to do? We would like to do things like compute the average value of this torus partition function by integrating that torus partition function over the space of conformal field theories. Now, when I perform this integral, here, let me write this integral a little differently. We're going to need to integrate it with some probability measure, okay? Which is going to be some probability measure on the, from probability density on the space of free boson field theories. Okay. And so the first thing that we're gonna have to ask is what is that probability density? And it turns out that there is a very natural answer when we're talking about spaces of two-dimensional CFTs for what that probability density should be. Um, but in fact, even given everything I've told you now, there's already a very simple guess for what that probability measure should be. And that's just found by remembering T-duality. So remember that we're studying a free boson on a circle of radius R. And a free boson on a circle of radius R is the same as a free boson on a circle of radius one over R. Okay. That's T duality. Uh, you know, I wrote down this formula for the partition function in order to remind you of that fact, because you'll notice that this partition function is invariant under the T duality symmetry that takes R to one over R. So that means two things. That means, first of all, that when we think about the moduli space of CFTs, we really don't wanna count uh, the same CFT twice. So you should really think about this moduli space as labeled by coordinates R, that's the radius of the free boson on the space of theories, where R runs from one to infinity, not from zero to infinity, because otherwise we'd be double counting our field theories. But the second point is that any probability measure that you write down should be invariant under the symmetries of your theory. So in particular, we want a probability distribution that is invariant under R goes to one over R. Otherwise we're not defining a good probability density on the space of theories. So in fact, given that, you could already guess what the correct probability density is going to be because there is a unique or, no, that's, that's a lie. I should say there is a natural measure, that is to say a natural metric on this space of theories that is invariant under R goes to one over R. And if you stared at it for a second, you would immediately write down that metric and you can check easily, dr squared over R squared, dr over R is invariant under R goes to one over R, okay? And so, when we, our guess for the probability distribution is just going to be the natural measure that's inherited from this metric. Okay. So I'm gonna take the probability density to be one over R. Okay. Good. So when computing these averages over the space of free boson CFTs, This t-duality symmetry teaches us what the probability measure is and what the correct range of integration over the space of CFTs is. I have a possibly naive question. Yes, please. Uh, the uh, moduli space of C equals one CFTs also includes the orbifold branch. 
Uh, so Great. why don't you consider Great. it here? Good. So remember my starting point was uh, I wanted to take the U1 times U1 current algebra. Ah, and so uh, the U1 currents are like dx and dx bar. So mm -hmm. if I took the Z2 orbifold that takes x to minus x, I'm projecting out those operators. Okay. You could expand your perspective to include those as well. Um, but though, you know, my, my, the starting formulation of my problem is that I wanted to preserve this symmetry algebra. It would be a separate discussion if we wanted to consider a larger space of CFTs without symmetries. I think once you don't have symmetries, sort of, uh, you know, you've unleashed a Pandora's box of possibilities. For C equals one, it's not so hard. You can actually go ahead and just do the calculation explicitly. Uh, it's not bad, but for higher central charge, uh, it'll get pretty thorny and I don't know exactly what happens. Good question though. Yeah, thank you. Good. Now, Sorry, um, uh... please. Alex, could I ask something else? So you mentioned before uh, that there is a very natural answer for spaces of 2D CFTs. Uh, and I was wondering a bit like, would this be for any given CFT or are there yeah. other? So I'm, a bit, I'm a bit confused by that statement. Yeah. Let me clarify yeah. that statement because it was sort of an offhand remark I didn't, I didn't explain fully. So whenever you have um, CFTs that live on a moduli space, that is to say CFTs that are continuously connected to one another. Um, the statement that they're connected to one another means that they're related by uh, the addition of a marginal operator in the action of the theory. Uh, and so you can take the two point function of those marginal operators and think about that as a metric on the space of theories. This is known as the Zamolodzikov metric on the space of conformal field theories. And it turns out that the metric that I have written down here coincides with the Zamolodzikov metric. That's easy to do, easy to see. What is the operator in the present case that changes the radius of the free boson? Well, it's just dx dx bar, okay? Because, you know, if you added dx, d, d, if you added dx d bar x to the action of the theory, you could absorb that into a rescaling of x, which is essentially a rescaling of the radius. And so you could just go ahead and compute the two point function of that operator. And indeed you'll see that it exactly coincides uh, with the metric that I wrote down below. Okay. And the same will be true at higher, for higher, higher values of the central charge as well. Okay. So this is the, so I motivated this choice of the metric by saying, well, it's invariant under T duality. Um, it's also the sort of canonical metric that you would define on a space of, of CFDs. Now, if you're considering a fancier problem where you have conformal field theory, theories that are not related by marginal deformations, then um, we would have to have a separate discussion about what the proper choice of measure on that space of theories would be. Um, I have a guess, but I don't have a, as, as, as good a justification for it. Good. Okay, that makes sense. Thank you very Thank you. much. So there's a big problem, however, in what I've discussed which is that when I said that my probability density was one over R, um, I lied to you, okay? Because one thing that I know about probability densities is that they should be normalizable and that the integral of a probability density over all possibilities should be one, okay? However, if you were to try and compute that integral, you get infinity. If I had a finite number, that would be no problem. I would just divide P of R by that number. Uh, but uh, this probability distribution I've written down is not normalizable, okay? And indeed, if I were to take that theta function I wrote above and plug it into this formula here and try and perform that integral, I would get infinity, okay? So at this point, you might just uh, throw up your hands and uh, give up. But it turns out that this divergence is just an artifact of the fact that I was considering only a single free boson. And that once you consider more than one free boson, all of these problems go away. So in particular, if you take the similar set of examples with central charge D, then it turns out you can write down analogous formulas. They're a little bit more complicated, but it's basically the same thing I wrote down but suddenly you have a normalizable probability distribution. So let me just tell you in a few words how that works. So we now have D free bosons. Let's call them XP, where P runs from one 
up to D. Okay. And the action, so let's now write down the action of D-free bosons. So the most general action that you can write involves a symmetric D by D matrix and an anti-symmetric D by D matrix. that I have called G and B here. I've called them G and B for the same reason that I called the central charge capital D, which is that if we were doing a world sheet string theory, then G and B would be a target space metric in B field, and capital D would be the number of space-time dimensions. And these coupling constants, G and B, should be regarded as coordinates on the space of free boson field theories in D with central charge D, which teaches us that the space of CFTs has dimension equal to D squared. Little, a little bit like the space of n by n matrices, except now instead of integrating over the space of n by n matrices, we're integrating over the space of conformal field theories. Again, it just has dimension uh, n squared or d squared, where uh, d is the central charge. And again, I'm taking these to be compact bosons. And basically these uh, metric components G are the analogs of the radii of these free bosons. So here, for example, I'm taking all of my free bosons to be periodically, to live on a target space circle uh, of radius one or of circumference two pi, okay? Um, and the component, the GPP components, for example, are just the radial coordinates of these target space theories. So I'm normalizing everything so that uh, the X fields uh, live on circles of radius one, and I'm treating the metric and the B field as the independent coupling constants uh, that label my space as CFTs. So again, it turns out that these theories have a T-duality symmetry. So we now have a T-duality group. And the T-duality group is much bigger. So the T-duality group for a single free boson was Z2. The T-duality group for D free, bo free bosons is O D D valued in the integers. So this is an infinite T-duality group. And again, it turns out that there is a natural metric on this space of theories that is invariant under this T-duality symmetry. What is that metric? Well, it's actually very similar to the metric that we wrote down up here. So I'll just write it down for you. So instead of factors of one over R, we have factors of the inverse metric. I remind you that G and B are coordinates on my space of theories. And so when we write down the metric on the space of theories, it'll be in terms of these G and B coordinates. And here I'm doing the usual uh, convention where G with upper indices is an inverse metric. So the metric on this space of theories. So this is the natural metric that is invariant under that SO, the T-duality symmetry. Again, it also coincides with the Zamolanchikov metric. And with respect to this metric, this moduli space now has finite volume. And in fact, uh, although I've written down an explicit set of coordinates and metric on this space of theories, in fact, there's a much more geometric way 
of thinking about this moduli space, which is as a coset of SODD. So here, this moduli space, again, is a space where I mod out by T-duality symmetries. And uh, it can be represented as this coset. And this is known as Narain's moduli space. Okay. Um, if you're familiar with this, that's great. Um, if not, um, uh, don't worry about it. Um, it just happens to be the case that the space of theories under consideration is uh, has a, a group theoretic structure of this sort. Okay. Roughly speaking, the way that we think about it is that these free bosons are coordinates on a d-dimensional torus, and if you and any two tori uh, can be related to one another by a rotation. Because what is a torus? A torus is R d modded out by a lattice, and you can relate any two lattices by an orthogonal rotation. And that's what this orthogonal group is growing, is doing here. That's the set of rotations that relate these lattices to one another. The only slight wrinkle in that story is that it's SODD instead of SOD because the left and right movers are more or less treated independently in this way of thinking about it. In any case, if you don't like thinking about it in terms of uh, you know, abstract groups, uh, you could just think about, you know, I've written down a coordinate and coordinates and, and a metric on a, the space of theories here. And now it turns out then that because this moduli space has finite volume. That means that you can think about the measure induced by this metric on the space of theories as defining a normalizable probability distribution on this space of theories. So here, I'm just labeling by M a point in this space of CFTs. And now we can go ahead and start computing averages over this space of theories using this probability distribution. So when I talk about an average over the space of CFTs, that is exactly what I mean. Notice the crucial role that t-duality played here. The t-duality group is infinite, right? So if I hadn't quotiented by the t-duality group here, I would have gotten a divergent answer for uh, uh, the volume of the space of theories. And I wouldn't be able to talk about some nice normalizable probability distribution on the space of theories. One question. Please. Uh as you did before, now that you have a, a metric, which is not just like a number, in, in order to find PM, you would use like the, the, the density, like the square root of the, of the determinant of the metric. Exactly. I wrote down okay. a metric. Uh, I, it, you know, it's a metric in D squared dimensions. Uh, by DM, P of M, I literally just mean the volume element. So okay. we could write that, it that way. You know. that, it, it was uh, just that. Okay, a, thanks you know, uh, let's call it DVOL. Okay. okay, fantastic, thanks. Great. Okay, so we now have a nice normalizable probability distribution, and you could go ahead and start computing things like averages of partition functions, okay? So in particular, you could do something like compute the average of the torus partition function. So here, M is a point on moduli space. Tau is a point in the torus moduli space, okay? So this is And this is going to be the average spectrum of the theory. So the average of the trace of Q to the L0 Q bar to the L0 bar. So this is going to be computing, you know, if we were doing a matrix integral, this is the thing that would give you the semicircle law. Okay. But now we're doing it in a space of theories, space of CFTs. And you can see that I'm just doing some finite dimensional integral. 
right? How hard can it be? You know, uh, upstairs, you know, upstairs on the last slide, I wrote down the partition function of a free boson. Here it is. The partition function of a free boson in one dimension, a single free boson. Okay, there was a one loop determinant and a theta function. So for D free bosons, it's just going to be a one loop determinant and a theta function. And I'm not going to bother writing down the formula for you because it's so similar to the formula that I wrote down above. It's just that, you know, N and W, those momenta and winding, are now going to be vectors rather than of integers, rather than just a pair of integers. And I'm going to just, and one could at least um, in principle, just go ahead and compute that integral. I mean, I say in principle because it's actually a hard integral to do. Um, uh, fortunately, however, um, mathematicians are very smart. Um, and two mathematicians in particular, uh, Siegel and Vey, uh, were very smart in exactly the right way that we need. And they computed this integral for us. And they did it long before uh, anyone ever thought it might be interesting for physics points of view. And I won't bother to derive the formula. I'll just write down the answer. So the first thing to notice is that there's a one-loop determinant, okay? So here we have D free bosons. So instead of one over the square root of that one-loop determinant I wrote down above, we get D factors of that. You know, that one-loop determinant doesn't depend on the moduli because that's the thing that was there even for the compact boson. That's the thing that counts descendants. Uh, that just goes along for the ride. It doesn't depend on where you are in Narain moduli space. It's really the uh, other thing, the theta function, that depends on where you are. And so that's the thing that you need to average. And when you do that average, you get a result that I'll write down for you here. So the result turns out to be what is known as an Eisenstein series. But it's not the sort of Eisenstein series that you may have encountered before if you studied these things in number theory. What you studied before if you encountered Eisenstein series in number theory were most likely a holomorphic Eisenstein series. Uh, this is what's known as a real analytic Eisenstein series. So um, what sort of form does it take? So here we've integrated over uh, the moduli M. So this is a function only of tau, the torus moduli. And uh, you know that it better be a modular invariant function of tau. That is to say invariant under SL2Z transformations. So in particular, if gamma is some element of the modular group. So that is to say it is a two by two matrix with unit determinant and integer entries. Then that acts on the torus modular parameter in the familiar way via fractional linear transformations. And uh, we know that our answer for this partition function better be modular invariant. And the way that this happens in this formula is that the average partition function is a sum over this modular group. It's an average over this modular group, okay? And typically, uh, such Eisenstein series are denoted E with a subscript that is the weight of the Eisenstein series. And in this case, the weight is D over two. That's the number of powers of M tau that are appearing here. Okay. Good. Sorry, uh, in the sum, did you mean uh, modded out by Z2 or uh, just Z? By Z. So in particular, what is that Z? Hmm. So uh, M tau is invariant under tau goes to tau plus a constant. So tau to tau plus n is a subgroup of SL2z, okay? That is generated by elements that look like this. Yes. And so note that the sum and appearing in this Eisenstein series is invariant under tau to tau plus constant. So if you wanted to get a finite answer, you shouldn't sum over all of SL2z, right? So that's why I've done that right coset SL2z mod z. Thanks. Thank you. Good. 
because actually has a, a, a phys that has a physical interpretation. Yeah. But in any way, you needed to do that to get a finite answer. Good. Now, uh, there's one other thing that I should mention, which is that although we've only written the torus answer here, it turns out that we can also compute the average of the partition function on an arbitrary Riemann surface. So here, uh, I'm sort of schematically representing that by a, uh, a, you know, some genus two surface. And this is what's known as a Siegel-Eisenstein series. Or more properly, a higher degree real analytic Siegel-Eisenstein series. Uh, I'm happy to write down some details if people are interested, but I think for the sake of keeping things relatively simple, um, I won't do so uh, in too much detail. Okay. So we're now uh, really almost done, surprisingly enough, because our goal was to find a, a space of theories where we can average over CFTs, compute uh, the average of observables and compare this to our gravitational expectations. And in particular, this formula that I've written here, it turns out has a very simple interpretation as coming from a gravitational path integral. Okay. So let me give a name to that formula, I'll call it star. And the point is that this formula star is exactly what you would expect from some gravitational path integral, where it is going to be a sum over classical saddle points of some sort of classical action with a one loop correction. So in particular, that sum over the modular group SL2Z, I'm going to interpret as a um, sum over geometries. And in fact, it's a very famous sum that has appeared uh, many times in the literature before when people try and understand the sum over geometries in theories of gravity in ADS3. Okay. So what is the idea? The idea is that this modular group, SL2Z, or I should say rather the coset SL2Z mod Z, labels geometries, and in particular labels a class of geometry known as handle bodies, that fill in the boundary torus. So now I want to think about my boundary theory as living on a torus. And I want to think about a gravitational path integral, a bulk path integral, that can be used to compute this partition function by summing over geometries whose boundary is a torus. Okay. Now, what three manifold could you write down whose boundary is a torus? Well, it's a solid donut. So for example, you could imagine filling in the interior of this torus. And I'll indicate that by drawing a cycle in the torus, that circle, which is going to be contractible in the interior. But if you think about it, there are actually many different ways of filling in a boundary torus. How can you see that? Well, remember that if you have a torus, you have two cycles that are complete, treated completely democratic. Right? There's no difference between them. But when I drew this picture here, I had to choose one of those cycles to make contractible and one of the cycles which is not contractible. So what that means is that I have a entire choice of possible uh, topologies or geometries that I could use to fill in the boundary that are labeled by a choice of which cycle is contractible in the bulk. And indeed, 
you can show that it is exactly this coset that labels which cycle is contractible in the bulk. And in fact, uh, you know, we already have names for the geometries that appear in uh, the sum, right? So for example, uh, you know, we started out these lectures by talking about ADS as a geometry with a time direction and a spatial direction. And so if you were to get a torus just by identifying a Euclidean time direction, then you would get a solid donut where the phi circle is contractible. So that means that the geometry where the phi circle is contractible is what you would call thermal ADS. It's the geometry that you would use to study a thermal gas of particles propagating in ADS. On the other hand, we discovered that there was another Euclidean geometry, the Euclidean that comes from a black hole. And that's one where the time circle is contractible, not the phi circle, right? Because what does it mean for the time circle to be contractible? It means that there's some location on the geometry where the coefficient of dt squared shrinks to zero size. And we have a name for a place where the coefficient of dt squared becomes zero. That's an event horizon, right? So the Euclidean continuation of the ADS Schwarzschild black hole is one of these handle bodies, but where the Euclidean time circle is contractible instead of the spatial circle. And so you can see that the sum over geometries that we're talking about here is a sum over um, bulk uh, manifolds in locally ADS3 manifolds, it turns out, whose boundary is a torus. And that includes things like black holes. There's one final uh, question that we should address, which is what about uh, the loop corrections? So in order to uh, think about these loop corrections, we need to remember one more thing about ADS CFT which is that every time you have a global symmetry on the boundary, that's gonna to correspond to some kind of gauge symmetry in the bulk. And I started out with a family of CFTs. So we started out with a family of CFTs with a huge global symmetry. The U1 to the D times U1 to the D global symmetry. And it turns out that, uh, so let me say that a different way. Because we have this huge global symmetry in the boundary, we expect a huge gauge symmetry in the bulk. And in particular, we expect a U1 to the D times U1 to the D gauge symmetry in the bulk. And what sort of gauge theory could you write down in three dimensions that would realize this gauge symmetry? Well, the simplest option, and it turns out the correct one is a chern simons theory. And I want to interpret this chern simons theory as the perturbative degrees of freedom of our bulk gravity theory. Okay. And you can now see why it is, I said our bulk gravity theory should be one loop exact. Okay. Because if you have a churn simons theory uh, for some gauge group, the structure constants of that churn simons theory are the things that appear as the coupling constants, the three point coupling constants of the theory. So if you've got a U1 gauge theory, then uh, you know it's a free theory. And so everything in the bulk is gonna be one loop exact as well. And indeed, you can actually uh, take this um, a bit further. And you could go ahead and compute the one loop determinant of Chern Simons fields in uh, one of these handle body geometries. This is now going to be a 3D calculation. Uh, you know, Chern Simons theory has no local degrees of freedom. So you might think things like computing one loop determinants are trivial. Um, they're not entirely trivial. 
Uh, the reason being uh, that when you do this calculation carefully, you need to take into account the fact that you have no degrees of freedom because of gauge transformations. And so uh, really the proper one to determine in calculation involves a, a gauge fixing procedure, but I have pop up ghosts and all of that stuff. So even though you might think that the one loop determinants of Trin Simon's theory uh, uh, are completely trivial, um, it turns out that they're not entirely trivial because you know, when you compute a one loop determinant, you compute a one loop determinant for a bunch of, of gauge of vector fields of, of vector bosons, and also a one loop determinant for a bunch of ghosts. And you have an, they cancel out only up to a small correction term. So you have one loop determinants for three dimensional differential operators, and they cancel out up to the one loop determinant of a two dimensional differential operator. And what is that differential operator? It's that thing that sits right there. Okay. I mean, for those of you who know about the relationship between Schrodinger Simon's theories and, and WCW models, uh, this is not at all surprising uh, because that prefactor was a conformal block for a current algebra. Uh, you know, to some extent, what Schrodinger Simon's theories do for a living is they compute conformal blocks uh, 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 on the boundary. So all I'm describing is a version of of that calculation. Um, but nevertheless. It means that we have an interpretation for every single term that is appearing in this sum. The sum over uh, SL2Z is a sum over saddle points described by manifolds of different topology. The one loop determinant comes from the excitations of gauge fields in the bulk that correspond to the global symmetries of your theory. And that's it. You might ask about where do these factors of m tau come from? Well, those factors of m tau are more or less guaranteed to appear in the calculation by modular invariance, because it turns out that those one loop determinants on their own uh, are not modular invariant, but transform in a particular way under modular transformations. And you need those m taus there to soak up everything and make the whole result modular invariant. So if you go through carefully the one loop determinant calculations, you'll find that those one the, those factors of m tau are indeed there. Okay. So what we have here then is a picture where a sum over geometries, and in particular a sum over handle bodies, exactly reproduces an average over a space of CFTs. And although when I was writing down the formulas, I was only stating things uh, uh, for the torus case, exactly the same thing happens at higher genus. So in particular, the higher genus uh, sum over geometries includes a corresponding sum over these handle bodies. Okay. That is to say now geometries where you imagine taking the interior of some higher uh, genus surface. And it includes a sum over all possible ways of doing that. And so that will involve some sort of sum over a higher, higher genus or higher degree modular group, which is some sort of symplectic group. Similarly, you can compute the Chern Simons partition function that counts perturbative stuff in the bulk. And you're also going to get uh, some sort of character for, or I should say, some sort of conformal block for a U1 uh, to the D current algebra on the boundary. Okay. Now, at higher genus, it turns out that you can't write down those one loop determinants explicitly. So on the torus, I wrote down that one loop determinant explicitly uh, in terms of these. Um, in terms of the static and data function. Turns out there's no exact analytic expression uh, at, at higher genus, um, but nevertheless, you can show that the one loop, the Chern Simons one loop partition function does exactly what you want. You know, uh, even though you can't write down the functions in sort of simple analytic forms, you can still show that this exact uh, relationship between the average uh, partition function. And the sum over handle bodies goes through. So here, 
schematically, you might represent, think about this sum, this average partition function on a genus two surface as being a sum over handle bodies of this sort. Okay. And again, it's one loop exact for the sort of dumb reason that you untrain Simon's theory has vanishing structure constants. And I'm just about out of time here, but I'll just end by saying that this also gives us a very explicit uh, realization of the Euclidean wormhole picture that we started out these lectures with. So for example, you know, I have a space of CFTs. And so there's no rule that says I only have to average one partition function. I could average a square of a partition function. And it has terms that we interpret. So this can be computed exactly in this theory. I mean, you know, I wrote down the torus partition function for you. I wrote down the probability distribution on moduli space. It's an integral. It's a hard integral, but it's an integral that you can do. Okay, and you can write down the answer. And what do you get? You get terms that in the bulk gravity interpretation, you would think of as disconnected contributions plus terms that come from wormholes. So here I'll try and sketch a wormhole. And uh, roughly speaking, uh, this is what they look like. You know, they're bulk geometries that connect disconnected boundaries. And the fact that they are there is, is no surprise. I mean, they were baked in from the beginning because I have a probability distribution with a non-trivial variance, okay? So you, think, no, you know such things have to be there. The nice thing about this theory is that I now have a geometric interpretation of all of these wormholes. And in fact, although I won't write it down for you explicitly, it turns out that it's possible to compute this uh, variance exactly. Um, you know, uh, for those of you who may have studied um, um, JT gravity or um, SYK uh, or something like that, you know that typically um, the spectral statistics, which is what we're computing when we talk about this two-point function, we're talking about the two-point function of the density of states, the spectral statistics is, is packaged into what's known as a spectral form factor. And one can compute exactly the spectral form factor in uh, this model, uh, completely in terms of this uh, sum over geometries. I won't bother writing down the details, but I'm happy to discuss features of that um, if people are interested. Uh, I am out of time, uh, and I think this might be a, a good place to end. Um, there's obviously a lot more that can be said about this class of, of theories. Um, so uh, I'm happy to sort of speculate further, um, but um, maybe I'll do so in the discussion period. Thank you. Oh, wait, and before, before we end, I believe I am the last lecturer uh, on the last day of the school. Uh, so um, I wanna take this opportunity uh, to thank the organizers uh, and all of the administrative support for helping this all run smoothly. Um, so I don't know how many of the organizers are here, but you should all raise your hands and, and, and let's all maybe unmute ourselves and give them a, a round of applause for organizing uh, such a great school. Um, uh, that was, you know, that I think we all, we all enjoyed. So thank you again on behalf of everyone. Um, yeah, and, and Pavel, uh, I'll just mention, mentions that uh, at the end of the discussion section, which is to say in 15 minutes, there'll be a group photo. So everyone who wants to can turn on their camera and take a screenshot, just how we do things nowadays, I guess. Okay, thank you very much, Alex. Um, you. Yeah, as you said, this was the last lecture on the last day. Um, so people are probably tired, but let's see if there are any questions, uh, I mean, comments. It's morning for me, I'm not tired. <laughs> Please. Um, yeah, go ahead. Uh, go ahead. Oh. Carmen? I think probably Carmen. Well, maybe for me. Okay. Yeah. Which... Uh, okay. Uh, so 
Yeah, thank you very much for the lectures, Alex. It's, it's uh, it, they you. were nice. Um, I wanted to ask a bit more, if you don't mind, uh, sharing about the intuition you mentioned about uh, CFTs that aren't connected through the marginal operator deformation. Um, because yeah, like I yeah I, it, it seems really obscure to me so far. And like it, yeah. I guess it's a problem that a lot of people are thinking about. Maybe. Yeah, I mean, uh, um, and I. Did my video disappear? Oh no, here I am. Okay, uh, good. Yeah, let me let me mention. Okay, let me mention a little bit of speculation. So, my guess. Okay, and I can tell you where this comes from. My guess is that when you sum over CFTs, so. In general, um, we don't expect CFDs to be connected by a moduli space. That's a sort of a weird accident that happens uh, uh, when we're considering this particular family of CFTs. You know, it, it's kind of a miracle for a CFT to have a marginal operator. Uh, in the present case, we had uh, symmetries that guaranteed the existence of a marginal operator, uh, but generically it would be a miracle to have a marginal operator, which means that a typical CFT you would expect to be isolated. So generically, I would expect that a sum over CFTs would be a discrete sum rather than an integral. And um, you then would have to guess uh, what sort of measure would appear. And in principle, you might imagine that different gravitational theories would be associated with different measures. Of course, you know something like type two string theory would be associated with a delta function measure. But if you were to ask me what the generic measure is, I would say it's probably one over the automorphism group of the CFT. Okay. There's a couple of reasons to think that. Um, one is that if you look at the siegel weil formula, you know, um, the original form of the siegel weil formula, the thing that you would find on the Wikipedia page, uh, if it has a Wikipedia page, um, is not gonna be this fancy integral over a moduli space. It's gonna be a discrete sum over a discrete space of lattices. That's because mathematicians uh, generally don't think about lattices and Lorentzian signature, um, uh, which is the thing that's relevant for this Narain moduli space. They think about Euclidean signature lattices that live that 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 you know of which there are a finite number, right? You know, even self-dual lattices in Euclidean signature, you know, there's like 24 of them in 24 dimensions or something like that. So um, there's a finite space of lattices. You get a finite sum, and the measure that appears uh, is this one over automorphism group measure. Um, you know, this is a kind of natural thing uh, from our point of view, um, uh, which I could, you know, there might, I think there's some physics reasons to think that might be the right thing. But in any case, I think that's the most natural guess. So if you had to ask, if you asked me, what is quantum general relativity to the extent that such a thing makes sense dual to, I would say it is an average overall CFTs with this one over automorphism group measure. That's a conjecture, however. Um, uh, was that a, a reasonable answer? Okay, good. Yeah, uh, yeah thank you so much. Yeah, it was very interesting, thank you. So maybe we'll go, uh, I think uh, Upamanyu, you had your, yeah. your hand up. Yeah. So, uh, <clears throat> my question is about uh, uh, the family of CFTs for which D is small enough. I think mm -hmm. given for D equals two, uh, you would have uh, uh, well-defined yeah. probability distribution, but then the yeah. central charge would be small and uh, your yeah. background would be highly curved. So I was wondering uh, in, and that stringy corrections okay. would be very important in, in that case. Yeah. So I was uh, thinking uh, for such a case uh, for over all the uh, members of the ensemble of the CFTs have a very uh, strongly curved gravitational dual. Uh, yeah. How should one think about it? Okay, great. There's a couple things to say about like the finite central charge uh, case. So the first thing is that um, I lied to you as I usually do um, because I called this a classical action and I called this a one loop action. Um, usually uh, in order to have a clean separation between a classical piece and a one loop piece, you need a uh, a coupling constant, you know, h bar that is small. Yeah. But what is the perturbative description? 
I said the perturbative description involved the U into the D Chern Simons theory. Okay. That means, and what is D? D is the central charge. So remember that the central charge is like one over H bar. Okay. Yeah. Uh, and um, I chose, I had C, that is say a central charge number of perturbative degrees of freedom. So the number of perturbative degrees of freedom is also of order one over H bar. You know, when you talk about loop corrections, loop corrections are suppressed relative to tree level corrections. Uh, uh, if you fix the number of degrees of freedom as you take H bar to zero. But if you have a number of perturbative degrees of freedom that grows as H bar, then loop corrections uh, are not suppressed relative to tree level corrections. So what that means is that, although I wrote this as a classical action in a one loop piece, uh, they're all mixed up together, right? They're all of the same order. Right. And so, um, uh, you know, the way that I compute them is using the technology of loop corrections and classical actions, but they're all of the same order. So your question then is, why do I trust any of this at all? And the answer is that uh, uh, everything is one loop exact because I'm studying a free theory in the bulk, right? Hmm. Uh, you want and Simon's theory in the bulk. And so, um, you know, under normal circumstances, if loop corrections are the same size as tree level corrections, all of perturbation theory is broken down. Everything is one loop exact though, here though, so I don't need to worry about them. You know, in a real 3D theory of gravity, uh, I wouldn't expect, you know, C is genuinely a large number uh, and I don't have a number of light particles that scales with the central charge in this way. And so I would expect a good separation between the classical and loop effects, okay? So it's really wrong to think of this even at large central charge as a kind of normal semi-classical theory. I see. Um, the question that I thought you were going to ask actually is a different question, um, which is one of the things that we noticed in the paper is that if you consider a very complicated observable, where you're considering the 